This is Bishop Gregory Brewer's sermon at St. Thomas Episcopal Church, Eustis, Florida, on December 8, 2013. If in the midst of the busy shopping days, I ask any of those people, what is, in fact, the definition of Christian? More often than not, what it means is something along the lines of what people will tell you is sort of following the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's the definition of what it means to be a Christian, or something along those lines. Um, I want you to know that a part of me wishes that it were that easy. Um, as the scriptures make plain, I think, the dish, I think what it means to be a Christian and the call to be a Christian, were it not for God's power operating on our lives, is actually an impossible life. Not just a difficult life, an impossible life. Because we need God, frankly, to come in and do things for us, both in our hearts and then through us that we could never ever accomplish left to our own devices. You see, that's why we begin in this Advent season with the collect which calls us, give us grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins that we may greet with joy the coming of our Redeemer. And I don't know about you, but that's why I need God right off the bat. You see, I, there are some things of which I'm aware that I know I don't do well, and that I, in fact, might, I might actually do quite badly, for which I certainly need repentance. All of us can come up with the short list. Nod your head. Of course you can. We can think of it. We know those things. And believe me, if we're not aware of them, someone like our husbands or wives will tell us, or our parents. That's, that's the obvious list. But then there are other things of which, quite honestly, I'm entirely unaware. And that's, in fact, one of the ways that I need God, is to show me the things in my life that, in fact, need changing. Because I don't have the capacity, you see, and neither do you, to literally stand outside of yourself and observe both who you are, both on the outside, and even more difficult, on the inside. There are certain things of which I'm aware, but only certain things. And to be honest with you, because I already see the things that I, I'm not particularly happy about, where I know I need changing, I don't know that I always want to dig a little deeper to see what else might be in there, right? Um, and, and so it's not just that I need God to show me the things that I can't see. I actually need God to open up my heart in such a way, because I don't necessarily want to do that always, so that I can in fact see. In other words, I need help with my desire to see, as well as the capacity to see. And, and that's just getting started. Because once I in fact see, then what do I do about it? More often than not, the things that I bury, that I wish weren't there, are buried to my conscious mind and part, because I have no idea what to do about them. So I play this funny game with myself, as many of us do, where if I just act like it's not there, maybe it'll go away. And, and because I, I, don't know, I don't know what else to do. So when it comes to repentance, I'm not so good at this, much less heeding the warnings of the prophets and forsaking my sins, as we pray in the collect. If any of you think that that is in any way a simple matter, it means you just haven't done it very much. <laughs> in other words, I have to start from the very beginning to say, God, in the midst of a season that I would much rather spend doing the things that everybody else does to get ready for Christmas in terms of the decorating and the buying and the planning of events and all the other things that go along with it, which in fact I think it's a lot of fun, mostly. Um, to actually take the time to begin to think seriously about the implications of personal repentance. I don't know about you, but for I think most of us that's not pretty much, that's not very high on our to-do list this month. And yet that's that's exactly what the lessons are calling us. 
I want to briefly walk through each one of the lessons and think about the implications as it applies to this call to heed the warnings of the prophets and to forsake our sins. The first is, of course, one of the most passive, famous passages in all of the Bible, which is a description of the Messiah. A shoot shall come from the stump of Jesse, a branch shall flow from its roots. And there is this actually really quite wonderful description of who we believe to be Jesus. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, of knowledge, the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eye sees, etc., etc., etc. I love this because this means that the one to whom I turn, asking him to help me with this condition in my heart, over which I have very little power, is in fact perfect for the job. There is no one better. Because he, in fact, does not see, as the scripture says, as the eyes see. Or as it says in the book of Proverbs, men look on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. Because you see, I need someone to see me differently from how I see myself. And Jesus is perfect. For that because he himself is perfect and because he is someone upon whom the spirit of the Lord rests with wisdom and understanding and counsel and might that means he knows precisely not just the ability to show me what is in my heart he knows what to do he knows what to do about the condition of my heart again he's perfect for the job but what that means is, what this asks of me, is not just sort of asking the Lord to help me with repentance, in and of itself a formidable task, but instead what it asks of me is first to place all of, whom, of who I am in the hands of this Messiah who is so perfect for the job of changing, organizing, healing, and restoring the brokenness of my life. In other words, I, I can't approach Jesus as if to say, Jesus, I need your help on this, but when things are going better, then I'll see you later. Which is, again, often the way that we, way we deal with God, do we not? If, if life gets desperate, then we can pray desperately. But if life is going well, because we're short on the gratitude side, more often than not, then we're sort of feeling like, I'm doing pretty well, I can take the wheel myself, thank you. But a part of what these scriptures imply is, is that if Jesus is to do the very thing he was made to do as the unbegotten second person of the Trinity, it means I yield to this one wholeheartedly. That's what in fact it means to call him Lord. In other words, he can't be a part-time savior. Either he's the one to whom you had yielded your life even in the midst of occasional rebellion and sin, or he is still the one waiting for you to get your life together. And believe me, I don't want to be in the latter choice because I don't know how to do that. Because you see, I think that is the choice in front of us. Either we're yielding who we are to him and all of who we are for better or for worse, or we're keeping God at a distance. And believe me, I have to tell you what, I don't want to keep God at a distance because God can't take, and C.S. Lewis makes it this way, there are only two kinds of people in the world. He says, there are those who say, have your way, O oh God. And then there are those that God says, okay, have it your way. And believe me, since I don't know all that is in my heart, since I've lived enough life to know that there are places in me that are profoundly inadequate, and that the challenges of life are much larger than anything I could ever muster, even on my best days. The last thing I want is for God to say to me, okay, have it your way. <laughs> and so I need God to deal with my own rebellion against his sovereign authority, even as good a savior as he is. But he is more than willing to do that. So in this Advent, I have to ask you, 
Are you one who says to God, Oh, have it your way. Or are you one that God is saying, Well, okay, have it your way. Repentance by its very nature means I'm doing what I know how to do, as feeble as it might be, to say to God, have it your way, O oh God. I don't want things to go just my way. <laughs> I know where that can lead. If I say to God, okay, Lord, have it your way, that means it's not just a question of cleaning up the stuff that he has inside of me that needs to change. It also means that I now have a job description. That's actually the meaning of confirmation. To be confirmed is to believe that God has a job description for you, a calling and a vocation in your life, and you're willing to yield all of who you are to that vocation and to that calling, to discover what it is and to give your life to it, your might to it, all of who you are. You see, John's problem with the religious leaders in the Gospel reading, whom he so uh, undiplomatically calls a brood of vipers, is precisely because they had a calling and they did not carry it out. And in fact, were quite happy not to. They wanted to be in charge. And therefore, John is actually the voice of calling them to repentance that they might not face the judgment of God, which is far worse than anything you and I could ever imagine. <laughs> and so that instead they might repent and yield and say to God, God, I want it your way. And that is the essence of what Advent means. It means looking and saying, God, I want it to be your way. Show me, if necessary, if I don't yet know it, the vocation and the purpose and the calling that you have for my life. And believe me, that has very little to do with whether you wear one of these collars or not. A vocation of purpose means that wherever you are, wherever God has placed you, whatever venue you're in, whatever your job is, whatever's on your calendar for the day, in every one of those circumstances, you are open and available for God to use you as He sees fit. And because God is no respecter of persons, that could be the shop person at the convenience store. That could be your neighbor across the street. That could be your relative that you don't like and wish wasn't your relative. It could be all kinds of people. You see, that's the thing. You and I want to be in control of those things. And God says, uh-uh, if I'm going to be the one in charge, then I'm one of those people who actually likes everybody, even the ones you don't. And I care about them just as much as I care about you. And therefore, as much as you want to create a club of people that you like and leave out all the rest of the people, if you belong to me, that's just not going to happen. You see, that's the message in the Romans lesson. All of this, what we think of as rather highfalutin language about Jew and Gentile coming together. The real point is, if we're going to be the people of God, that means everybody gets invited. Regardless of who they are. Regardless of whether we like them or not. Race, background, education, Family history, it's actually marginal in comparison to the call of God to come and to receive and become the people that God intends us to be. Which means, if I'm going to say yes to God, that means I'm going to be mixing it up with all kinds of people, some of which I like and some of which I just don't. So, if God's no respecter of persons, guess who I'm supposed to be? Also, no respecter of persons. Is that easy? No, it is darn difficult. I mean, let's be real about this. That's what I meant when I began at the beginning by saying, to, to be a Christian, in fact, is an impossible life. It's not just difficult, it's impossible. I need God to come in and change me and to do things in my life that I could never, ever do for myself. In other words, I need God to give me an ability to serve people I don't like. I need God to give me the capacity to be able to forgive those who have wronged me. I need God to give me the ability to be available even when I'm just plumb tired and don't want to go and do much of anything. And the phone rings and they, thank God they can't see my face because my eyes are rolling. Oh no, not now. Right? You do that too, don't you? I need God, you see. I need God. And that's what Advent's all about. 
where in the midst of all of the many things that we're doing, we gather here this morning to say, oh God, this is not easy. And I need your help. And in the midst of, particularly in the season where emotions are closer to the surface and life can be more difficult, and you'll be seeing people you wish you didn't have to see or give gifts to people that, well, they gave one to you last year, so I guess I have to do this, don't I? All, it, it really brings out both the best and worst in us. But if we're going to make it to the manger on the 24th of December with any sense of joy at all, I need a change of heart, oh God. I need you to teach me what it means to love and care in the way that you do. I need you to deal with the impossible things over which I have no control. I need you to help me change so that I also, as it says at the end of the collect, may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. So on this, the second Sunday of Advent, Christian, to be a Christian is impossible. I need God more than ever, but especially in this season, that I might not lie to myself or to others, but that somehow God might so change my heart that I learn how to love in new ways. That I also might greet with joy the coming of my Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Amen.